Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's symposium devoted to the subject of race and grace in Flannery O'Connor's iconic story, Everything That Rises Must Converge. My name is Angela Alima O'Donnell, and I'm the Associate Director of the Curran Center for American Catholic Studies, the sponsor of today's symposium, along with the performance of O'Connor's story this evening by Companion de Columbari that will take place later in the Leonard Theater. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors and supporters of today's events, including the Center for Community Engaged Learning, America Magazine, and especially the Mary Flannery O'Connor Trust, from which the current center received a generous endowment two years ago, making ambitious programming celebrating the work of O'Connor possible. I'm delighted to serve as moderator today of, of our symposium, as well as a member of this distinguished panel. Our goal today is to look at O'Connor's story through a series of different lenses, consider it from a variety of disciplinary perspectives, have some conversation among ourselves, and then to invite you, the audience, to participate in the conversation as well. As many as of you are likely aware, a symposium, in the classical sense of the word, is a convivial discussion, usually accompanied by drinking wine. Since it's two in the afternoon, we thought it wise to dispense with the wine today. However, rest assured, there will be wine tonight at the reception after the performance. Before introducing our panel, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce Flannery O'Connor and her story. What is what, why a symposium and a play focused on everything that rises must converge? A story that O'Connor wrote and first published in 1961 and then again in 1964 as the anchor piece to her final collection of stories. What can a story written about imagined, imagined events that took place more than a half a century ago tell us about the reality of race in our own historical moment? O'Connor's story is among her most provocative. A middle-aged white woman and her grown son, Julian, board a city bus one evening en route to her reducing class. She has high blood pressure and needs to lose weight, and Julian must accompany her because she fears riding the bus alone since the enforcement of integration. Julian, who can barely countenance his mother and her racist and reactionary attitudes, thinks himself a liberal and an integrationist, though O'Connor's probing into his consciousness demonstrates quite plainly that Julian does not believe in the equality of the races. He is a poser who wears the guise of liberal politics as he sticks a pin in his mother's ideological balloon of white superiority. He's an excellent example of the adage, scratch a liberal, find a fascist. In this scene of child-parent dysfunction steps another mother and son. She is described as a large, angry black woman and is accompanied by her son named Carver, Julian's mother, who loves all children, especially little Negro children, develops a rapport with Carver, so much so that when the four get off the bus, she offers the child a shiny new penny in a disastrous gesture of noblesse oblige. Then all hell breaks loose, as it often does in O'Connor's stories. Carver's mother, enraged by this act of white condescension, punches Julian's mother, leaving her lying on the sidewalk, and disappears into the darkness. Julian then goads his mother, exulting that she has gotten her just desserts, keeping insult upon injury until his mother dies of a stroke. Julian is left alone, horrified at himself, and forced to come to terms with the fact that he has caused the death of his own mother. O'Connor lets no one off the hook in this story. Everyone behaves badly. The ending of the story is tragic, and no one escapes some measure of blame. The story is deeply troubling, as it is meant to be. All are implicated. To quote Julian's mother, The world is in such a mess. Julian's mother makes some version of that pronouncement three times in the course of the story. In the code of O'Connor's fiction, such a statement usually indicates that the speaker making it has limited vision and does not have proper regard for the world. As O'Connor once wrote in one of her letters, if you truly believe in the divinity of Christ, you have to cherish the world, even as you struggle to endure it. Julian's mother does not cherish the world, nor does Julian for that matter, and that's one of the reasons things go badly for them. But O'Connor does, and hopefully so do we. If we didn't, we wouldn't be here today on this gorgeous day inside shopping about Larry O'Connor. Nonetheless, there are times when we look around us and 
such a mess. There is, this is certainly true with regard to the ongoing saga of racial injustice in our country. O'Connor wrote her story at the height of the civil rights movement. In a few minutes, we'll hear more about that historical moment from one of our panelists. Suffice it to say, it was a difficult and a troubling time for both white and black people. The same, of course, can be said for our own historical moment. Eight years of the Obama presidency did not herald or usher in a new era of racial equality and harmony, as many of us had perhaps naively hoped. Instead, black and white people seem as divided as ever. This fact is demonstrated on a daily basis um, in the unjustified shootings of young black men, the news. Our disproportionate incarceration rate of black Americans continues to be a reality as the quality of health care for black Americans ranks far below that of whites and as the standard of living among black Americans continues to lag behind. And then, of course, there are the shameless public demonstrations of racial hatred that have become more and more common in recent years. The sight of white supremacists marching in Charlottesville two years ago, making the Heil Hitler sign, and chanting Nazi slogans shocked many of us. It would not have shocked Flannery O'Connor. She lived in rural Georgia, Ku Klux Klan country. As a Southerner and as a Catholic, she knew something about the nature of hate. Human beings may try to battle it, we may discourage it, outlaw it, or at least outlaw manifestations of it, and manage to drive it underground for a while, but it will resurface no matter what we do. Theologically speaking, of sin. Human beings can't cure themselves. So O'Connor would not be surprised to learn that our national sins of slavery, segregation, and the more subtle forms of racial hatred and injustice institutionalized in America continue to haunt us into 2019. We are still fighting many of the same battles that we were fighting in 1961. They're just no longer happening on the bus, as they do in O'Connor's story. They are happening in other places. And so it is with mixed feelings that we recognize the relevance of everything that rises must converge. There is satisfaction in being reminded that great art speaks of its particular moment, while it also transcends its moment and tells truths that endure. And there is simultaneously chagrin, the profound disappointment that we have progressed so little, despite the efforts and sacrifices of so many. Reading, discussing, and watching the story performed gives us an opportunity to experience how complex it was to live in that culture and in that time, to understand how fraught it was and how difficult it is for any society to change, and to see if that principle applies, to see that that principle applies to our own time as well. Yes, O'Connor reminds us, the world is in a mess. And yes, she tells us, we have to cherish it. Thank you for joining us for this challenging and important conversation today. So let us begin. I'm honored and delighted to introduce our panelists to you today. You can find biographies of each of our speakers on the program that we prepared. I hope you brought your reading glasses because it's very small print. So accomplished for our panelists. Um, so rather than read them to you in full, I will just give a short version. First, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Mark Chapman, Associate Professor of African and African American Studies here at Fordham. He is currently involved in research about the black prison experience and its implications for black liberation theology. He seeks to contribute to a prophetic critique of the criminal injustice system and its disproportionate incarceration of black Americans, who comprise 50% of the prison population. Dr. Chapman is the author of Christianity on Trial, African American Religious Thought Before and After Black Power, and he's the pastor of the Hollis Presbyterian Church in Queens, New York. The title of Dr. Chapman's presentation is One Ounce of Pressure Too Much, A Theological Interpretation of Black Anger. Next, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Rufus Barnett, who is a professor in Fordham's Theology Department. His area of study focuses on the sonic, spatial, and embodied realities of the Christian imagination. His latest text, Decolonizing Revelation, a spatial reading of the blues, takes up these realities with regards to the American music genre known as the blues. The title of Dr. Barnett's presentation is Who's Everything? Who's Grotesque? An Option for Theological Humility in a Pluriversal World. 
Third, I'm very happy to welcome Professor Karen Kuhnrad, an internationally recognized theater artist who is a faculty member at the Yale Stone School of Drama. She founded two acclaimed theater companies, the Art Party and the International Company of the Call of Barry, which will appear in the city tonight for more, both based in Orlando, Italy, and New York City. Professor Kuhnrad has directed numerous productions at the American Repertory Theater, the New York Shakespeare Festival, Public Theater, New York University, and New York Theater Workshop, among many others. Professor Kunrad is also the director of the play of the season. The title of her presentation is A Leap into the Theatrical Dimension. And finally, I'll briefly introduce myself as the fourth panelist. I'm an English professor, poet, and scholar with a strong interest in Flannery O'Connor. I've written four books that focus on O'Connor. One is a critical biography, fiction inspired by faith. The second is a book of hours based on O'Connor's prayer life, The Province of Joy. The third is forthcoming from Fordham University Press, Radical Ambivalence, Race in Flannery O'Connor. And the last is a collection of 101 poems that channel the voice of Flannery O'Connor titled Andalusian Hours. As you can likely tell, I've been a bit obsessed with O'Connor. <laughs> the role of black bodies and everything that rises must converge. These three very talented scholars and professors were extremely kind to accept the current center's invitation to serve on this panel, and I could not be more grateful or more delighted that they are here with us today to contribute to our conversation and to get it started.
can it be both? I suppose that is why Angela O'Donnell titled her upcoming book on the theme of race in Flannery O'Connor's work as radical ambivalence. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> Now, because I'm a preacher, I will take a text from the scripture. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. The Apostle Paul says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles that we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. We were under such great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, that we despaired of life itself. Now, 2 Corinthians is perhaps the most autobiographical of the Apostle Paul's letters, and it is the least doctrinal. In the letter, Paul gives readers tremendous amount of insight into his personal sufferings as a result of preaching the gospel. He talks about his sorrows, the anguish he experienced, the tears that he shed, the extreme poverty, the brutal beatings that he endured, the imprisonment, how he was stoned several times and left for dead. He writes about aches in his body, the false accusations made by his critics. He tells of the hunger and the thirst that he endured while he was shipwrecked at sea. And he also talks about the administration and the pastoral concern that he had for all the churches that he established. In short, the Apostle Paul was pressed beyond measure. Thus, Instead of visiting the Corinthians as the church there had requested, he had to say no. It was too much for to travel there and to be with them in person, given all the stress that he was under, would have been one ounce of pressure too much. So Paul writes a letter instead, and he explains why he can't come. He tells his beloved congregation, in essence, I would love to come see about you, but right now we are under such great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, that if we push it, we will burst. Now let's fast forward to the part of O'Connor's story where she describes the giant Negro woman who boards the bus with her little boy, Carver. O'Connor writes, quote unquote, her face was set not only to meet opposition, but to seek it out. The downward tilt of her lower lip was a warning sign that read, do not tamper with me. The woman sits down next to Julian, and Flannery O'Connor sets the stage for the rising tension. <clears throat> she writes that Julian was, quote, conscious of a kind of bristling next to him, a muted growling like that of an angry cat, and that the woman was rumbling like a volcano about to become active. The reader is thus drawn closer into this inevitable conflict because of the playful, innocent exchange between the black woman's cute little boy and Julian's mother. Now, as they play peekaboo on the bus with one another, the black woman grows increasingly upset and slaps the little boy on the hand and warns him Quit your foolishness before I knock the living Jesus out of you. <laughs> no doubt, 
At this point, the reader is asking themselves, why such an angry response to such an innocent exchange? And of course, those who know the history of race relations in the South will immediately think of Emmett Till, the 14-year-old black boy from Chicago who spent the summer with relatives in Mississippi and was brutally beaten and lynched because of an innocent, playful exchange with a white woman. So now, when they all get off the bus at the same stop, Julian sees his mother reaching for a nickel to give to the cute little black boy. And Julian knows that it will not be well received, and he does his best to stop it. But he cannot. And when this black mother hears Mrs. Chesney offer her son a shiny, bright penny, O'Connor describes her response with these words. The huge woman turned for a moment and stood, her shoulders lifted and her face frozen with frustrated rage. Then, all at once, she seemed to explode like a piece of machinery that had been given one ounce of pressure too much. Now, when I read that phrase, I paused. In fact, I could not read further until I fully absorbed those words. One ounce of pressure, too much. As I paused and thought, my mind first went to those three letters imprinted on the tires of my car, P S. I, <laughs> pounds per square inch. <laughs> For my car, it's 32 PSI, and in fact, I just had to add some air yesterday. And while riding on an underinflated tire can eventually damage the tire, causing it to go flat, an overinflated tire can explode if it has too many pounds of pressure per square inch. And then I thought about the pipes that carry heat, water, and oil in a house or a building. And I thought of how each pipe has a PSI rating, and if you don't use a pipe that is weighted for that amount of pressure, the, then the pipes can eventually explode. When the technician came to service our boiler just last week, he told me that he had to let some of the pressure out of the pipes before he could continue with the diagnosis, diagnosis and the tune-up of the boiler. One ounce of pressure, too much. That phrase has stuck in my head ever since I first read it. One ounce of pressure too much. And of course, far more meaningful than PSI for a car tire or for a pipe, I submit to you that Flannery O'Connor's description of this black woman's anger is an appropriate metaphor for explaining the origins of the civil rights movement. When African American soldiers returned from the battlefields of Europe after World War II, their inability to stay in a hotel or eat at a restaurant in the land of their birth was one ounce of pressure too much. When black women across the South were repeatedly gang raped by, by white men who were then acquitted by all white juries, that was also one ounce of pressure too much. 
When black men were lynched or executed for the mere allegation of sexual contact with white women, that double standard was one ounce of pressure, too much. So no, the civil rights movement did not begin on December 5th, 1955, the first day of the Montgomery bus boycott. That's what we are taught when we're in elementary school. The incredible, courageous activism that was displayed in the 1950s and 1960s, commonly referred to as the Civil Rights Movement, was the continuation of a long, never-ending black struggle for dignity and respect. And black women who were raped, silenced, stereotyped, and stigmatized were at the forefront of this dynamic movement for social change. So the black woman in O'Connor's story must be seen in the context of this history. Her reaction to Mrs. Chesney's innocent gesture was the last straw in a multitude of straws that finally broke the camel's back. It was the one ounce of pressure too much. Herein lies the recognition of her humanity. She is not a monster. She is not a raging beast or a stereotypical angry black woman. She is a human being whose personal trials and struggles are never mentioned in O'Connor's story. Her PSI rating was exceeded that day, and she was pressed beyond measure. On another day, she may have been able to respond with grace to what she interpreted as a condescending gesture. But on this day, she exploded. I look forward in the question and answer period to discussing with you how we might apply lessons learned from this story in our own struggles today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. I want to thank the Curran Center and my good friends Angela and Christine Fryer Henze for inviting me to this momentous occasion. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm gonna get started. We've gone in reverse order. Dr. Chapman has taken us to church but mine is a Saturday night juke joint interpretation on this. Mm -hmm. I like that. So as the title suggests, in the time I have, I'm going to speak about everything. <laughs> and since that is not enough, I will also speak about the grotesque and theological humility in a pluriversal world. O'Connor's short story provides an important opportunity for our readers to consider the American moment of desegregation through a grotesque Southern world of her making. The reader is also invited to consider how the theological imagination might contribute to what was then in the 1960s the latest experiment in representative democracy, the Civil Rights Act. Of course, as we know all too well, and some, some maybe not well enough, the Civil Rights Act of 1965 was not a voluntary experiment by a people of good faith. It was a legislative reaction to save the public from seeing the radical reincarnation of Denmark Vesey, Harriet Tubman, Nat Turner, John Brown. The nation had seen and feared the potential of bloody insurrection and did not want to reopen the chapter of the long 16th century, which they thought they'd close with the Emancipation Proclamation. From this vantage point, the Civil Rights Act is an act of counterinsurgence against the will of the people ready to deconstruct and replace the nation state with a more direct vision of democracy. 
Everything that rises must converge asks us to think through this moment of counterinsurgency through the eyes of a battle-worn white female Southern apologist for what Caretha Mitchell has labeled as know your place aggression. Hmm. We see this when Julian's mother cryptically states they should rise, but on their side of the fence. Julian's mom then engages in her own representation of the grotesque, the mulatto. The mulatto represented the failure of white supremacists to maintain the purity of their humanity amid the degenerate darker races. It also was the embodiment of another kind of being that reminded them of the myth of race consciousness maintained through the perniciousness and violence that poured salt into the original wounds of the colonized. The proliferation of the mulatto beyond the confines of enslavement right, marked the bitter biological reality that white skin and whiteness might fall to its own peculiar fetishization of black flesh, which rendered it as an object of sexual consumption. It is here at this level of flesh that we can see the importance of another fleshy idea, the theology of creation and the theology of the incarnation. Everything. Mm -hmm. Everything that rises must converge can be has been seen and can be made clear already that has been seen and made clear already from the quote from the French-born theologian Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who wrote, Remain true to yourself, but move ever upward toward greater consciousness and greater love. At the summit you will find yourselves united with all those who from every direction have made the same ascent, mm -hmm. for everything that rises must converge. While one can no doubt respect the creativity in Chardin's pen, there is something lurking behind the virtuosity of his theopoetic. His notion of everything, as a scientist, a paleontologist to be exact, philosopher, theologian, priest, Teilhard wanted to respond to the most important question of his European context. Similar to Julian's mother, Teilhard was interested in an ultimate question of human identity. Where Julian's mother saw the death of white supremacy as an end of the humanity at large, Teilhard saw the rise of secular scientific objectivity, that is a science untethered to the Christian faith, as a representation of the death of humanity, as he knew it in his Roman Catholic tradition. Teilhard's provi Teilhard provides a theological option amid the crisis of faith brought on by the scientific revolution and the works of Francis Bacon and Charles Darwin. As one interpreter, David Grumman, has argued, Teilhard was most influenced by the scientific research and evolutionary theory of a Frenchman, Jean-Baptiste Pierre Antoine de, Mont Comte de, Mar de Lamarck. While the details of Lamarck's evolutionary theory cannot be covered here, suffice it to say that Lamarck gave Teilhard a scientific route to recover what he thought was lost in Darwin's notion of natural selection. Right? Darwin saw natural selection as the driving force of evolution. For Teilhard, Darwin's notion of natural selection left no room for God's breath of life to reveal itself in the fleshy existence of humanity. In fact, Teilhard argued that Darwin's natural selection turned humanity into a being with, tenacious, with a tenacious sense of conservation, a being of survival. He saw them as animals competing with other animals for fitness. Lamarck's theory of evolution posited another driving force, the ability of certain beings to interpret and respond to the supposed luck of natural selection. Lamarck saw human ingenuity where Darwin saw chance. However, this ingenuity was about figuring, so for an example of this ingenuity is about a smaller human trying to figure out how to kill something bigger than itself, or maybe the curing of a virus. There is more to say here, but we must press on. Suffice it to say that Lamarck's recognition of human ingenuity set forth a different notion of evolution that referred specifically to humans. From here, Teilhard intuited that human evolution had a particular role to play in bringing the universe back into communion with God. Teilhard rereads human evolution with the help of Gregory of Nazianzus. Gregory says this about Genesis 321. 
for his sin, he was banished at once from the tree of life, he's referring to Adam, and from paradise and from God, and put on the coats of skins that is perhaps the thicker flesh, but mortal and contradictory. Gregory's insight is about the transition from a thinner form of flesh to a thicker form of flesh. <laughs> This thicker form of flesh is mortal flesh and is contradictory to the more perfect state of flesh enjoyed prior to the fall. Sin then becomes not simply about moral failing, but about a change in fleshiness <laughs> from one density to another. Now, of course, T.R., the scientist, was all over this <laughs> and thought, there's a scientist by the name of James Johns who kind of explains the Big Bang Theory that way. It's a movement of matter from a lesser state of density to a higher state of density. In this way, the sin of the garden sets forth humanity in a different embodiment in which they can intervene and act as they did when they ate of the tree, right? This produces density, complexity, plurality, ontological deficiency. All of this is resolved for Teilhard in convergence an omega point in which all of the universe will converge into ult the ultimate embodiment of God, Jesus Christ. Now for those TR scholars in the class, in the room, do not injure me for this rough shot of his many perspectives. Human invention and evolution ushers this process into being. This is precisely the point when one must ask, does Teilhard's theology engage in a hubris in that his universality leverages the objectivity of science and Christian revelation to tell everyone where they are going and what they are doing in relationship to the universe? The grotesque. Read against Teilhard's theological inspired Omega Point theory, O'Connor's work can be seen as her own participation, her inventive, her ingenuity, right? In the process of bringing the world into communion with the divine reality by moving ever upward towards greater consciousness and greater love. Her use of the grotesque is a call to her readers to look perhaps to the depths of the human experience beyond the contempt of Northern American liberals, those from the North, right? I mean, North and South America, not the countries, but in the states, right? Looking down upon the peoples of the South, right, as a representation of fallen humanity stuck in a perpetual state of backwardness. She illumines this in one of her essays on the grotesque. She says, I've found that anything that comes out of the South is going to be called grotesque by the Northern reader, unless, of course, it is grotesque in which case it's going to be called realistic. <laughs> Being concerned with the peculiar reality of race relations right, might be just as important right, as saving the church from the fall of humanity into secular objectivity of the scientific revolution. Right? For both of these projects, right, the authority of the church and the authority of science were too often funded by the flesh of many souls, too many to name the indigenous peoples of the Americas, Africa, Australia, the Pacific Islands, Asia, who were condensed into representations of anti-humanity. It was this same notion of objectivity in science that produced a new reincarnation, right? And found those who it deemed primitive to be fit for extermination, rape, enslavement. Sylvia Winter has troubled this and argued something different. She says this, at the end of the 18th and during the 19th century, the construct of the atavistic or ancient genetically diselected lack of normal human nature took the now purely secular place both of original sin and of the earlier hybridly religio secular construct of sensory nature. We could put Chardin in that, in that uh, articulation. The new lack, she says, was now conceptualized as the lack of racial normalcy and was embodied in the recently freed black Africoid population, amongst others, who now took the place of the pre-baptismal laity as conceptual other, as the embodiment of the fallen natural man mm. of the feudal Christian schema. 
the negative inheritance was no longer from Adam in Genesis, mm -hmm. but rather from the process of natural disselection mm -hmm. within the new secular origin text, evolution. In other words, you have to be a human subject naturally selected for a form of invention that practices in the prototype religion, Eurocentric Christianity, Eurocentric historical perspectives entangled with Christianity interpreted Europeans as the protagonists of evolutionary history. As the faith of the protagonists of history, Eurocentric Christianity is a faith perspective that is in need of being robustly critiqued. And we see this with the secular age, an emergent secular age of rationality. The phase of Africa, of the Americas, encountered in European expansion, right, remained under-considered, right, for the critique, right, that troubled the truth of Christian revelation. So there's no need to critique them because they're not subjects that bear a critique. This left non-European peoples outside of history. Mm -hmm. In addition to literature, there might be another route to rethinking the problem of Eurocentrism and the enfleshment of lack in the non-European, the blues. The blues artist Bessie Smith might give an even more visceral and fleshy interpretation of the depths of how the Eurocentric invention intervenes into the process of the universe reaching an omega point in the transfiguration of Jesus into the flesh of whiteness, his mind into the epistemology of Eurocentrism, his soul into the pursuit of self-interested materialist consumption. Her name is Bessie Smith, like O'Connor.